All right, we are live and recording. Good evening, everyone. This is Lynn O'Hara from National History Day, and we are thrilled to join you in our final 2019 World War I webinar series. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the makings of modern America with Dr. Christopher Capizola from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Before we pass things over, uh, I guess I'll pass it up to Boston to go ahead and get started. I've just got a couple quick housekeeping things just to make sure we're all on the same page. First things first, some final assessment reminders. I want to make sure, I'm actually going to jump out of the PowerPoint here and go into Schoology just so that, hold on just one second, I've got to reshare. I want to make sure that everybody can see exactly what we're talking about and everybody's on the same page. All right, so now you can see one of my Schoology sections. I popped into section six. Couple reminders. First off, make sure you find that gray folder with the final classroom activity information in there. What you've got available in there is the template. With that template file, it's a Word document. Please make sure you know you can download this. I want you to download it. I want you to type right into it. There's no need to type in the headers yourself. As you work through this, Think of the little blue bullet points. These are kind of Ashley and Marion and myself sitting on the shoulder and whispering in your ear. You could decide if it's the angel or the devil whispering, but we're trying to help you here. We're giving you little clues of, hey, what to put in here. Couple reminders and things to keep in mind that will help and make this easier. Number one, please read the directions. I promise reading the directions makes everything easier. Step number two reminder, the course is about the legacies of World War I. So please make sure that something in your lesson plan connects to a legacy or an impact. It can't be all about causes or all about the war. It's totally okay if the activity starts there and then expands out, but make sure to draw beyond the war. Uh, Third reminder, make sure that you connect to something in the class, something that we read, something that came up in discussion, something that one of our professors said. Keep in mind too, if you're stuck for ideas, I'm gonna guarantee you that Dr. Capizola is gonna give you 10 good ideas. And if you aren't started, shame on you. But if you aren't started, he's gonna get you started tonight. Third thing, we've got some resources and links to get you started. Um, you don't have to use these. You don't have to use any of them. It's just to help you kind of give you a starting point if you're not sure where to go. Finally, make sure you click on the activity and you go through the rubric. I promise we're not hiding anything. We're telling you exactly what we're looking for and exactly how we're going to grade it. And we're going to talk a little bit tonight. My strategy tonight is to talk about active learning strategies in the classroom. Again, if you don't have inspiration, I'm hoping I can give you a little bit tonight. On the deadline, key here, do Monday, December 16th, 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. What you will do is go in here. Now, since I'm in teacher mode, I don't have a submit assignment button. You'll have a submit assignment button over here. You click that, you upload it, you submit it. If you are nervous or wary or not sure, that's okay. Just email it to Ashley or Marion by the deadline if you have trouble with the upload. But I promise it's not hard. You're gonna be okay and able to do the upload. Um, the deadline's really important, and the deadline's really important because you have to bring them in Monday night. We owe grades to the University of San Diego by Wednesday night, so please, please, please give us our 48 hours because we want to be able to read them and give you the proper amount of feedback. Finally, last thing to know, we are going to share these. We're going to put them all in a Google Drive and share them out with everyone, so you won't just have access to the 20 or so teachers in your section you're gonna have access to the 117 teachers in the whole course. So you're gonna have more World War I activities than you'll know what to do with. Two other quick reminders before I turn things back over to Dr. Capizola. For those of you who did receive scholarships, you're gonna get an email from me for two things next week. Number one, we are gonna ask for a thank you note. That's really important for the commissioners that they receive a thank you note that talks about something that you learned in the class. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to send you the information to log your two presentations. Please remember that in your scholarship contract, part of the deal is that you share out what you've learned. So you've shared in, you share it in two different places between now and June. If you shared it a month ago, not a problem. 
when I send the link out next week, just go ahead and log it. We'll check in once a month and send a little reminder. As long as you do it between now and June, everybody's good. If you have questions on that, let us know. But honestly, this isn't about having a big formal thing with 600 people there. If you do, cool, that's great. But we want you to share it with your department, with your county, with your school district. We want you to share it at maybe a state council or an upcoming History Day contest because we need to multiply the effects of the investment that they put into you. Okay, that's all of my reminders. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna pause for a second. We're gonna turn things over to Dr. Capizola and he's gonna go ahead and share his slides. Um, and I'm really excited to have him join us because I read his book when we started doing some World War I initiative work about two years ago. And when we put him on the list for this fall, I have to be honest, you were kind of my dream get, and I didn't think you were gonna say yes. And I got very excited when you did. Um, and I have actually read your book, which is really exciting. And now all of our teachers have read at least a portion. And I'm willing to bet that if they haven't read it before, a bunch of them will be going back and reading it again. So go ahead and share your PowerPoint slides We'll talk about the making of modern America. Um, teachers, just to give you a heads up, uh, Dr. Capizola is going to do a little direct instruction, and then he's going to go to a little bit of discussion. For the discussion, we're going to use that question and answer box. Just like before, if you have questions while he's talking, throw them in. I'll stack them up on my notebook and answer as many as I can in the end. And then from there, um, we'll do a little discussion in there, and then we'll take more questions at the end. Okay. All so, you? I'm sorry, but your PowerPoint is not shared, just so yep. you know. I'm going to, how do I share? There we go. Um, Perfect. All right. So before I dive, dive into this, first, um, uh, Lynn, just confirm that, that you can see everything and you can hear me. And hopefully, we are I mean, good to go. Good. Your video is on. If you want to turn it off, you can click it off. If not, uh, we'll watch you as you talk. You know, I'm, nobody wants to see that. Um, <laughs> so why don't I do that? Right, um, and then I just want to say a, a little bit of thanks first to, to you, to, to Ashley, uh, to everybody else at, the, at National History Day. Um, I also want to thank um, the, the students who participate in National History Day. I get um, sort of email inquiries from probably many of the students um, of the teachers who are on this webinar. And I, I try to answer absolutely as many uh, as I can. Um, uh, and I, because just that the excitement that the students bring to that enterprise, I think is really contagious. Um, so I thank you for supporting um, kids in your schools who are doing these kinds of projects, big or small. Um, what I wanna do is, uh, is just sort of dive in to, um, to a, a little bit of a lecture. So I'm just gonna talk over this PowerPoint uh, for about 30 minutes. Then I'll stop and maybe we can have a couple of questions, but maybe not all of them. Um, then I want to actually kind of talk as, as closely as we can about those documents that I sent you. Um, these, these letters that were sent by very ordinary people um, to, to the government um, during the First World War as a way to think about what it means um, to be an American in wartime. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I wanted to do um, was, uh, let me just back up one second, there we go, to the cover slide. Um, I also want to just add a little bit of, um, of, a, of a bio. So, um, you know, Lynn um, you know, gave you my title, I teach here at MIT, but I think it's important for you all to know I started uh, by teaching seventh, eighth, and ninth grade social studies. Um, I was teaching U.S. history and world history and European history. I've worked with uh, English language learners who are studying American history. Um, and you can love me or hate me when, you, when I tell you this, but I also worked on the AP U.S. History Development Committee. Um, so I, you know, I, sort of, I, I want to kind of leave some time for discussing what does all this really look like in your classroom? Because right, I think that's the much more important question than just sort of, you know, what are the legacies of World War I? Right? Um, it's great to think about those for the next hour and a half, but I also realize that we all have to get up and, and, and teach um, in the morning. Um, so let's, let's try to leave here with something really practical um, from that. All right, so let's dive in. Um, what I wanted to do was to start, actually, um, with, with the beginning of the war um, and with a kind of moment of, of confusion right, um, that many Americans had. Um, when uh, they suddenly had to understand what was happening in Europe. And this was one of the favorite, uh, my favorite sources that I discovered when I was researching. This is the cover of the Seattle Star from August 1st, 1914, very first days of the war. But notice what it says on, on, the, uh, on, on the headline here. Cut out this map and follow moves of European war. 
um, that this suggests that people really didn't know where this war was happening. Uh, they, they read atlases, they tore maps out of the newspaper, they gathered around kiosks in town squares. They were trying to find these places, Sarajevo, Gallipoli, Verdun, Versailles, all of these words that are in our history books now, but that were new to people then. Just as a, a century later, we look for, for places when we learn about overseas conflicts. But what I want to suggest is that when people were looking um, for all these, these places of war, they were also in some ways looking for themselves, um, looking for a place for themselves in this war. Um, and when they did that, they transformed their place in American society. Um, and that's the lasting legacy that I want to talk about tonight. A transformation in the political structures uh, and cultural meanings of what it meant to be an American. Um, that shaped American politics for the next two generations, and I think in a lot of ways for, for a whole century. So I'm gonna focus uh, to some extent tonight on the, on the formal category of, of citizenship, um, knowing that citizenship is two things, right? It's a, it's a legal category that says, are you a member of this society? Are you a citizen of the United States? Or are you a citizen of some other country? But citizenship is also a, a sense of belonging, a sense of meaning. Do you feel like part of this society? Do you feel included, um, recognized, um, a, a part of this country, a part of this war effort um, in World War I? So I'll talk about both those meanings um, and the particular role of the federal government in shaping that. Um, and there'll be some overlap um, with Professor Benton Cohen's presentation last month, um, just because immigration is an important component of, of that. Um, there will be, if you did the webinars last year, there will be some, some overlap with Professor Lent Smith's discussion of, of African Americans. My hope is not uh, just to repeat, but maybe to kind of drive home um, from different angles some of the points that, that they made in their earlier talks. Um, but let me begin, actually, um, by just emphasizing the, the huge power of the federal government um, during the First World War. So by any metric you can come up with, um, the, the same thing happens during World War I. In a very brief period of time, from the time the U.S. enters in April 1917 to the time the war ends in November of 1918, uh, the U.S. government gets bigger. Um, in a very short amount of time. Then after the war, it gets smaller, but it never goes back to where it was before, right? So uh, any metric, like, like I said, any metric you want to use, the number of federal employees, the number of soldiers in the standing army, the legal authority that the government has over private behaviors, um, even the size of the federal budget, all of those um, expand drastically during the war. Um, and they go down afterward, but never to what they were before. This is a transformative moment in US history. There's also new federal powers. Some of these are in the Constitution. The US had just adopted uh, the 16th Amendment, which gave it the new power of the income tax. Um, and this was designed uh, to sort of transform the American economy. Uh, not that many Americans paid it at first, but it's a new power that the government has. Um, there's also, a, uh, the 17th Amendment allows the direct election of senators. Um, this is a federal power that was uh, designed to prevent the U.S. Senate from becoming a millionaire's club. Um, unfortunately, that reform uh, didn't really work, um, at least uh, by any measure since then. Um, but we see people engaging directly with the federal government um, through that amendment. Then, of course, comes uh, new powers of regulating alcohol, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, first, as a wartime measure in 1917, and then with the 19th Amendment ratified in 1919. The government begins intervening in disputes between business and labor, where it had never been seen before. The federal government nationalized the railroads and the coal industry, uh, two of the largest industries in the United States, overnight. Uh, the federal government is administering the very first IQ test. Um, the government is literally changing the clocks uh, by instituting daylight savings time. Right? So by almost anything you can come up with, Uncle Sam is everywhere in Americans' lives. Uh, and they need to make some sense of that, of what that means and how that is transforming them. I want to walk through a few different examples now, and then um, you know, we can come back to any of these in the discussion and Q&A uh, later but I want to focus on how people are moving around um, and being transformed through this process. 
So I'm going to start somewhere actually in many ways where Professor Benson Cohen left off last month. Um, in many ways, the most significant transformation um, in the American polity, in sort of who we are, um, came when the, the outbreak of war brought a sudden end to transatlantic migration. Right, um, that immigration drops off drastically, um, and it drops off in by 1915, not when the U.S. enters the war, but almost immediately. And if you think about it, there's three reasons for that. Right, first, um, there's a war on in Europe. Um, what that means is that uh, there are armies in Europe that are drafting young men who were disproportionately among those who immigrated um, at the turn of the century. Uh, so many of them are staying in Europe um, and fighting. In fact, many immigrants return from the United States uh, to join the war effort back in Europe. Second, uh, there's a war on in Europe, um, which means uh, that there are jobs in Europe. And so a lot of the motivation Americans or Europeans might have had to migrate to North America are suddenly gone, right? The third explanation is, and you can guess what I'm gonna say, there's a war on in Europe, um, which means that there's submarine warfare in the Atlantic. So transatlantic migration is now suddenly uh, not only um, un unnecessary for economic reasons, um, but dangerous for, for physical ones. So migration, just to give you a number, uh, migra migrants from Europe uh, reached a peak of 1.06 million in 1914. So in 1914, 1 million Europeans entered the United States. Um, that drops to 198,000 in 1915, right? That drops drastically. And by April 1917, when the U.S. enters the war, uh, by that point, Ellis Island, which you see here, sat almost completely empty. Um, and in fact, it's later turned into uh, an incarceration center for political opponents of the war. Um, an, an irony um, that shows the transformative power of the federal government during this period. Now, overall rates of, of immigrant entry to the United States um, wouldn't return to those levels until the 1990s. Um, and if you adjust for the fact that, that our country is nearly three times bigger now than it was in the 1910s, they've never been as high uh, since then as they, as they were then. But that doesn't mean that people aren't moving around, right? And here I'm going to draw on some of the other things that you've heard on a little bit as well. Um, Professor Benson Cohen brought you to, to the US-Mexico border a month ago, um, that this transformation in European migration um, also uh, created and accommodated um, new migrants from other places. Here we see an image um, of the Mexican revolutionary Pancho Villa in the middle. On, uh, on his left, um, our right, um, is uh, General John Pershing. Um, who spent uh, many of the first years of the First World War, uh, not in Europe, but on the U.S.-Mexico border. This image shows them getting along. By 1917, uh, that would no longer be the case. Right? But more than 100,000 uh, uh, Mexicans entered the United States as political and, uh, refugees um, and out of economic necessity during uh, the Mexican Revolution and the Civil War that follows. This transforms labor markets in the United States, creates kind of Mexican-American communities in a much bigger number, um, but it also um, gives a space for Mexican-Americans to articulate their political claims as Americans, um, using their political loyalty, using military service to make political claims on, on America later. And I think for a lot of us who are trying to teach in classrooms that are more diverse, have more Latino students in them um, than a generation ago. Uh, we often don't really teach enough Latino history before, say, the 1960s. Uh, and I think this represents a moment when we can teach about organizations um, such as, for example, LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, which was founded in Corpus Christi right after uh, the end of the First World War. So I think that the, we can see sort of meanings of identity uh, uh, changing at this time period, and we'll also see how that matters, that federal power is changing as well. Now, similarly, to go back to some of the other themes, uh, the war also uh, transforms African-American populations by enabling large-scale migration of, uh, of African-Americans from the rural South um, to the urban South and to the North and West. Now, this migration um, really begins in earnest in the 1910s as the economy starts to boom. Um, not, if, not all the migrants are as, as uh, wealthy and well-heeled as the women that you see here in this photograph by James Vanderzee um, from the 1920s, uh, 
Um, but nevertheless, um, this is a mix of political motivations um, and economic attractions that are bringing African Americans to fill many of the jobs that, that were left open by the war boom and the fact that European immigrants are not coming in great numbers. Uh, but I think thinking about the Great Migration can be a great way to, uh, to actually notice the power of the federal government in doing this. Right? So here's my uh, story that I like to tell about the Great Migration. Now, when I teach about issues of Jim Crow and, and the, the rural South at the turn of the century, um, often my students, um, when they think about these difficult situations that many uh, African Americans, and in fact, also many poor white Southerners struggled with, um, they ask, well, why didn't everybody just move? Right? Why did it take until World War I um, for the Great Migration to begin? Um, and here's where we see Uncle Sam's power at work. Um, that the rural South was, by almost any metric, the most cash poor part of the American economy. And in some ways, one of the most cash poor parts of the global economy uh, in the early 20th century. It ran on a debt economy of the company store, um, totaling up debt at the end of the year. You've probably encountered these stories. Then fast forward to 1917, when Uncle Sam is drafting uh, soldiers from all around America, including um, African-American men from the rural South. Uh, the uh, the pri a typical private in the U.S. Army earned about $30 a month, um, and that was uh, a cash salary. And if the, he, this man was married, um, uh, half of his salary would have been sent home um, before he ever saw it uh, to, his, to his family. This is a, a policy that's designed to keep uh, rural families from going into even greater debt. It's also designed to keep soldiers from gambling or uh, you know, sort of, um, drinking all of their earnings away um, in France. But nevertheless, imagine what happens when $15 a month in cash arrives in some of the poorest parts of America. That uh, poor black Southerners and white Southerners use some of that money um, to buy train tickets to Chicago, to Philadelphia, to Washington, D.C., uh, to, even, to find new jobs um, in Richmond, um, in Atlanta. Um, and I think we can really see a dynamic back and forth between federal power telling people what to do and federal power opening up avenues for people to do new things that they want to do. Okay. All right, let me keep moving. All right. um, so another example of this where we can see federal power at work is the, the Selective Service Act of 1917. Um, now, this is the draft, um, which is uh, adopted by Congress in May of 1917, um, right after the U.S. enters the war in April of 1917. The image you see here is of uh, Secretary of War Newton Baker drawing the very first numbers in the draft lottery of that time period. Um, and that is, in fact, a fishbowl um, that he's drawing them from. Um, I, I have a colleague at the Minnesota Historical Society who, in fact, actually found that fishbowl. And it was on exhibit there during, uh, during a museum exhibit last year. Um, they bought it at a local pet store in Washington, D.C. So it shows, you know, sort of the, the concrete nature of, of war um, at work. The, the draft, um, in fact, actually transforms the, the power of the federal government. It requires all male citizens in the United States between 18 and 45 to register for the draft, along with immigrants who had taken out their first papers intending to become citizens, what we would now call a, a green card. Right? And now all of these men were required to register for the draft, uh, to locate themselves um, to, before the federal government, um, and to document their identities um, in ways that gave the federal government more power to see them, more power ultimately to control them. So another thing to think about, um, think of all the ways that the federal government today might know sort of who you are, uh, what sex you identify as, uh, sort of what your age is, what your citizenship status is, uh, and in fact, how many of those documents existed 100 years ago. Um, there, almost no one had a driver's license because there were very few cars. Um, almost no one had a passport unless they were a diplomat or a, a, a merchant. Um, there were no social security cards because there was no social security in 1917. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, there were hardly even any birth certificates. Uh, that was a relatively new invention that the progressive era had developed. Uh, so in fact, the, uh, the federal government has an, a power to enforce the draft, um, but it doesn't necessarily have the skills and the abilities to do so. So we can see federal power expanding faster than it, it can actually keep up with institutionally. 
And I wrote a little bit about that in the chapter that I, that I shared with people. I'm going to give you a few more examples um, as we go through today. So one of the things that, that has to happen then um, is that the draft has to be enforced. Um, and this leads um, to widespread use of voluntary associations, um, such as the American Protective League, um, which was a volunteer group of about 250,000 uh, American volunteers who traveled around the country enforcing the draft by asking American men to show those draft cards, the, those, the first identity documents issued by the federal government in US history. Um, and if they couldn't show them, they could find themselves detained or incarcerated um, in the so-called slacker raids, um, which is one of the best names for any sort of undertaking in American history. The slacker raids, um, the largest of them in New York in September 1918, led to the detention of nearly 50,000 men over the course of three days in September 1918. Now, what you're looking at here is an image that, um, that uh, purports to be one of a, uh, of a slacker raid from 1918. But uh, I have my doubts about this image because if you look closely, um, you'll notice that all the men in, in, on the truck are, are smiling um, or laughing, um, which if I had just been uh, sort of rounded up for missing my draft card, I'm not sure that I would look quite so happy. So my hunch is that this is a, a staged reenactment to show how a slacker raid works. But there are some other images of slacker raids out there, and these happen in cities and towns all across America, um, and would make a great research project if you wanted to get see if there's some local history that students might be able to do in some of the more advanced grades. So <clears throat> as this was happening, uh, the US government is trying to identify who is a citizen. They're also trying to identify who is not a citizen, um, and this leads to the, the enforcement of the Alien Enemies Act, right? Now, if you're trying to kind of remember, um, is this chapter 16 of the textbook or chapter four of the textbook? Um, in fact, the Alien Enemies Act is from 1798. It's a relic of the, the, the war, quasi-war with France, um, but it was still on the books in 1917 and President Woodrow Wilson invoked it uh, to impose new obligations on German citizens, so-called enemy aliens, and that required them to, to register with the federal government, to be photographed, to be documented. And there were restrictions on their movement, uh, restrictions on whether they could own radios or other kind of uh, wireless equipment, whether they could own firearms, what kinds of jobs they could have. Um, and by the war's end, nearly 6,000 German enemy aliens have been interned temporarily um, over the course of the war. So we see the federal government exercising not just power over its own citizens, but also power over non-citizens um, who were in, in their midst during the war. Um, and of course, this overlaps with broader propaganda images against Germans and German Americans, um, with rumors, with, uh, with discrimination that lead to uh, sort of real violence um, and in fact discrimination and assault over the course of the war, as we can see from this sort of gruesome propaganda image. I'm going to come back to this um, in the second half when we talk about that, that letter by the German American Women's Sewing Club from 1918. That's a, this is an important context for understanding that letter. All right, so let's uh, keep going and think about, well, what is, if we have, government has a certain power over its citizens to draft them, it has power over non-citizens um, to, to regulate them. What does it do with people who are not citizens but who are nevertheless in the US armed forces. And I think World War I is a crucial turning point in military service by immigrants and, and non-citizens during the war. What you're looking at here is a petition for naturalization, someone who wants to become a citizen of the United States. Um, and this, this person, Peter Germani, um, who was looking to become naturalized um, and was according to the laws of, of this time period. The Military Naturalization Act made it very easy for immigrant soldiers um, uh, to naturalize. Um, nearly 200,000 of them do so during the course of the war. Um, and this is in part to reward them for their service. It's also to bring them into line with uh, the, the sort of terms of international law. Uh, but it also shows that what it means to be an American and what it means to be a citizen are lining up more and more closely over the course of, of this time period. Um, as one New York newspaper put it, the country that is good enough to live in is good enough to fight for. Um, and this, in fact, actually becomes an important moment for transforming uh, immigrants in the U.S. armed forces 
but immigrants also transform the military in turn through their service, right? That bringing uh, four million American men um, into the into the U.S. armed forces in some form, right, and twenty five thousand American women in some form, um, actually ends up uh, having as much of an impact on the army as it does on the people who serve. And I think we can look see this by the relationship between religion and citizenship. That uh, the, the U.S. was a, a religiously diverse country and has been ever since our founding, but it had become especially so after a generation of migration from Southern and Eastern Europe that had brought large numbers of Catholic and Jewish immigrants to the United States. And so they want, they're in, they're in the service, they want to serve, um, but they're also looking for religious, um, for their religious freedom, their religious exercise. Um, and they run up against an institution that still takes for granted that our, our, our soldiers uh, and sailors are primarily uh, Protestant. And so you can see Catholic and Jewish soldiers and others really sort of challenging institutions, asserting their religious values, demanding that, that um, the YMCA, which is a Protestant group, not be the only group um, at a military base, but that the Jewish Welfare Board, the Knights of Columbus, and other groups were also a part of that effort. Right? And so we can really see how people are transforming the content of citizenship, um, even as they're, as they're uh, serving during the war. There are limits to this, um, and I think an important limit to this um, is for Asian American soldiers um, who are uh, serving not in great numbers during the First World War, um, but who have an important legacy to tell. That many of them served and sought to become U.S. citizens or claim their citizenship through uh, military service, um, and they were challenging laws that had been adopted and all the way back in 1870 that restricted uh, naturalization to, quote-unquote, uh, white persons and persons of African nativity or descent. So basically white and, and black Americans could be naturalized as citizens, but Asian American immigrants were specifically excluded um, from this right. And many hoped that their military service would, would sort of overcome that obstacle. Um, and for a few of them it did, until in 1925, the U.S. Supreme Court in a case called Toyota versus U.S., uh, actually ruled uh, that, in fact, uh, never, despite their military service, Asian Americans who served in the First World War uh, could still not be naturalized as U.S. citizens. So I think this shows the limits of, of, of military service to expand uh, the terms of citizenship during the war. And it leaves a legacy a generation later. And this is, I think, for me, one of the most um, poignant and kind of touching images, um, not from World War I, what you're looking at um, is an image from 1942, uh, a Japanese American father and son who are about to be incarcerated under the Japanese internment program. Uh, but notice that he's wearing his, his uniform, right? He's wearing his American Legion hat. Um, he's sort of documenting, the father is documenting his military service um, and pointing out the irony um, of having fought in the First World War uh, and being in, uh, interned during the Second World War. Right. So we can really see both the opportunities and the limits of, of the expansion of citizenship during this time period. Now, <clears throat> military service, on the one hand, is, uh, is a, a requirement that applies overwhelmingly to men, um, but it has an impact for women as well. Um, and I want to talk for one second about this woman, Rosika Schwimmer. Um, who is, was well known at the time for her political activism. She, it's a name we don't know so much about anymore, but her case is really quite interesting. Um, Rosika Schwimmer was a pacifist um, who was opposed to war, actively organized in suffrage movements and women's peace movements. Um, and in 1926, she applied to become a U.S. citizen. She was a refugee from Hungary. Um, she had fled there to the United States. Um, she needed citizenship to get a job to support her family. Um, and the, the citizenship forms ask, would you take up arms in defense of this country? And Schwimmer was a pacifist. Um, and so she said, no, I would not. Um, and for that reason, um, her citizenship claims were denied um, and the U.S. Supreme Court approved them. Um, now, there's an irony here, which is probably pretty obvious if you look at this image. At the time she was asked that question, would you take up arms in defense of this country, Schwimmer was a 56-year-old woman um, who would never have been allowed uh, to, to join the U.S. Uh, armed forces, even, uh, e even if she had wanted to. Uh, but nevertheless, the expectation uh, 
that people must at least state their willingness to serve um, left a, a, an important legacy um, for uh, religious dissenters, pacifists, and, and other opponents of war um, during these years. Um, <clears throat> Um, I'm going to sort of keep moving so that we can come to a kind of conclusion. I want to fast forward and talk a little bit about federal power to, sort of, to regulate and to police. Um, and here I think it's important to think about this small organization, uh, a small branch of the Justice Department that at, that at the time of the First World War was known as the Bureau of Investigation. Um, and it included, uh, it eventually was handed over to a new young uh, sort of officer and when I was working in the archives, I kept reading these letters um, that were signed John E. Hoover. And I didn't really recognize until I read a whole bunch of them that in fact, that's someone we bet know better as J. Edgar Hoover, um, who you see here uh, as a young man, um, who became the director of the Bureau of Investigation um, right after the end of World War I and remained so all the way until his death in the early 1970s, um, a crucial figure in the development of the 20th century American state who gets his start during the war. Now, the Justice Department um, was quite small, but it actually tripled in size um, during the course of the war and doubled again um, just in 1919. So it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and has new powers, first to regulate the draft, then to look at uh, uh, enemy aliens. There's also a military intelligence division within the army, which is keeping watch on, on radicals and keeping watch on soldiers themselves. Um, and of course, a lot of this power is coming from the, the new federal power to regulate alcohol. So when, often when we teach about prohibition um, to our students, and you know, um, it's important, I think, to, to do so, um, we often frame it in the context of the 1920s, right, as an experiment of moral regulation and controlling people's behavior at a time of great consumerism and urbanization. But prohibition is also an experiment in federal power. Um, how much power does the federal government have? Um, can it tell states and localities, especially so-called wet states, ones that supported um, the free sale and distribution of alcohol, um, can, it, can it tell them what to do? Can it impose federal power on states and localities? So we're always looking for ways to teach our students more than one example of times where the federal government and the states have been in tension. And prohibition is, an, I think, an important moment in that. But it's also an important moment in the transformation of, of uh, federal power at the U.S. border, right? Um, that in fact there's smuggling of alcohol and from Canada, um, from uh, from Mexico in the Caribbean. This is giving the U.S. government more and more power over this. Right. So I'm going to skip ahead to a couple of other places where I think we can see uh, citizenship being transformed. Um, <clears throat> And what I'm going to focus on here is also how citizenship matters, um, not just for people who are um, uh, immigrants from, from Europe or, or from Asia, um, but in fact, people who are in this in-between status um, as colonial subjects, right? Um, people who, a generation after the wars of 1898, um, are residents of, the, of Puerto Rico, of the Philippines, are U.S. nationals um, with many of the rights of, of Americans, but not quite American citizens. Um, and so the document you're looking at here is not a petition for naturalization. It's not a petition for a passport. If you can read the top, it says application for a certificate of identification, right? Um, it's a form that, uh, that someone from Puerto Rico might actually seek if they wanted to travel abroad. Right? If they wanted to say um, that, it, as, as you read down further down, it says, I became a citizen of the United States by an act of Congress on March 2nd, 1917. This is the so-called Jones Act, um, which uh, announces um, that all Puerto Ricans were citizens of the United States, expanding that ter those terms of citizenship. Um, and, and this was a federal law that expands citizenship uh, in many ways without the full participation of Puerto Ricans um, in that process. Uh, it was not necessarily voted on by uh, Puerto Ricans themselves, it's voted on by the U.S. Congress, right? It extends citizenship uh, to them and without necessarily extending all of the benefits and, and membership um, that, that go along with it, right? So notice that, you know, there's those two meanings of citizenship are at work there uh, for sure. And I think another example where we can see citizenship expanding often without full participation or consent is in the history of Native Americans during and after World War I. Um, 
So what you see here is uh, in the middle is President Calvin Coolidge um, with a delegation of, of leaders from the Creek Nation um, who are uh, there right around the time of the signing of the, the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. Now, at least 12,000 Native Americans served in, in uniform, probably more than that um, over the course of the war, most of them in the U.S. Army. Um, but at this time period, about 40% of America's Native people were not citizens. Um, most of those were people who lived on reservations or um, who, had, who, in the eyes of the U.S. government, had not, quote, adopted the habits of civilized life. That was a legal category that was used in the early 20th century. So those who were not citizens um, didn't have to serve. They could have been exempted from the draft, um, but many of them registered um, anyway. They, they volunteered um, or, in fact, found themselves drafted um, whether they wanted to be or not. There was also an effort after the war uh, to, uh, to extend full citizenship to Native Americans. Um, and there's a great headline um, from uh, the, the magazine Literary Digest in 1918 that says, quote, if the red man can fight, why can't he vote, right? Um, and many people sort of looking um, for this, this uh, as a reward. And right after the war, um, Native American men who served in the, in the US military were granted citizenship. Um, and then the campaign continues until citizenship is extended to all Native people um, in the Indian Citizenship Act of, of 1924. But notice, um, this is again, it's coming from Congress. It's not a collective decision made by Native people um, with all their voices fully heard and recognized. Um, and there were in fact some Native people who actually objected to this imposition of citizenship um, at this moment. So I think when we teach about what it means to be a citizen, we have to make sure we don't just um, sort of imagine that extensions of citizenship are always, um, uh, always the same. Sometimes people might claim it Sometimes people might um, want to, to avoid it um, or to assert their own citizenship and sovereignty in, in for example, their Native American nations. So all of this brings us, I think, to this Immigration Restriction Act of 1924. And I'm not going to talk about this in great length because I know that Professor Benson Cohen talked about it uh, uh, in, in detail a month ago. But I think what I've tried to do is give you a sense of how everything else is also leading up uh, to this history of immigration um, that she talked about. Um, for me, in some ways, one of the most important legacies of 1924, and uh, one of the most important legacies of the war, is not just this act um, that you learned about last month, um, but one of the organizations that enforces it, the U.S. Border Patrol, um, which you see here in one of its earliest iterations, um, established in the summer of 1924 uh, to guard both the U.S. Uh, Canadian and U.S. Mexico borders. Um, and this was initially um, installed as a way of regulating smuggling of alcohol, firearms, and, and other matters, um, but very soon also starts to participate in political regulation of, of migration um, at both the, the Canadian and Mexican borders. And I think given the contested nature of, uh, of immigration policy in our contemporary moment, you know, I think we really owe it to our students um, to teach the histories of these institutions. Certainly in my high school history textbook, never mentioned the US Border Patrol, never gave it a history. And then I think that, that we, you know, whatever, whatever your politics are of the present moment, I think it's important to give students a sense of the history of the institutions that are being debated so, so strenuously today. So let me just conclude, actually, because um, I've run on long enough, um, by talking about one last thing. Um, this is an image um, of uh, a very fancy German cruise ship, um, which was known um, before World War I um, as the SS Vaterland, right? like fatherland um, in the German sense. Um, and in, when the First World War begins, um, the United States actually takes this ship over. Um, the ship was in, currently in the harbor in Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, the U.S. takes it over and turns it into a federal troop ship, um, sending American soldiers um, to fight in the war in Europe during World War I. Um, and then right after the war, it returns um, to its commercial status. What you're seeing here, it's not painted as a warship. It's painted, again, once again, as a cruise ship. But the name of the ship um, was the, the Leviathan. Um, the USS Leviathan. Um, uh, this was the same name coming from the Bible, the giant whale, right, that the philosopher Thomas Hobbes had used in 1651 when he wanted to come up with a, a metaphor for the power of the state itself, right, the power of, of the government over us. 
Um, and I think it's, a, it's an irony right, that, um, that the United States is, is expanding its power, sending uh, troops overseas to fight in its first war in Europe um, on a ship that it calls the Leviathan. Um, now, on November 11th, 1918, the Leviathan was set to, to carry soldiers to Europe. It actually leaves Hoboken Harbor that morning um, and at 11 a.m., the ship turns around and comes back to the port. This was an entirely symbolic effort that President Woodrow Wilson and other advisors deliberately did for publicity reasons. They wanted to assure Americans that this new power, this federal power, this thing we call Leviathan, this thing that most of us have these days just call Uncle Sam, and that it was a temporary wartime phenomenon. But in fact, it wasn't. Right? Remember those metrics, the size of the federal budget, the number of federal employees, soldiers in the standing army, the power to decide who is and isn't a citizen, the power to surveil and, uh, and regulate the borders. Those got smaller after the war, but not that much smaller. And during the Second World War, they would get even bigger. So we still grapple with the, the questions of a century ago. How big should our government be? What do we owe one another during wartime? How do we balance liberty and security? And not only do we ponder those 100-year-old questions, we also still live with the legacies and the choices that people made 100 years ago. The Leviathan turned around on November 11th, 1918. But for Americans who found themselves under the gaze of Uncle Sam, there was no turning back. So I'll stop there for a second and see um, if, before we jump into these, uh, the strategies, I wanna just take a couple minutes uh, before we talk about the documents and see, Lynn, if you can uh, help guide us through some questions and, and feedback. Absolutely. Uh, are there specific questions that you'd like to ask or do we wanna kind of open it up to focus on the topic of the letters? Um, let's save the letters for a few minutes and just start with um, with what we're what we're what we've heard so far because I do want to guide us through a discussion of, of those letters um, in, in a couple minutes. Excellent. All right. I've got three questions in the queue. I know there's more out there in your brains, though. Um, the first question I got was in 1924, were the Native American reservations considered part of the U.S.? And how did that work if they're not considered citizens, but they're living within the borders of the country and they always had? Yeah, no, this is a good question. And I see there's a, there's a next question that actually also um, is pretty related. So let me try to maybe answer both of them. Um, so Native American citizenship is very complicated, right? Because um, for, um, for most of, of kind of early American history, um, Native people were sort of seen as outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. Right? And if we think about that first part of the 14th Amendment, um, that you know, sort of all persons born are naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. That sort of clause in part reflects the fact that there were some lands, some territories um, legally known as Indian country, um, uh, some of which were formerly reservations, some of which were partially unconquered lands, where American power didn't fully reach. So Native people often, are, who, especially today, who recognize themselves as in recognized tribes or registered, uh, might have claimed a citizenship of their Native nations. Um, uh, and some of them would have also claimed U.S. citizenship. Um, for many of them, it didn't, it didn't really matter. U.S. citizenship in the 19th century for many Native people didn't, didn't get them much. It wasn't required for much. Um, and many of them didn't necessarily want those obligations um, or those rights, um, be, in part because every, they were still subject to everything else. They were subject to U.S. law, subject to, uh, to U.S. taxes, um, and in fact, subject also to, to the laws of, of registering for the draft. So it's a complicated question um, of sort of, of identifying this. Um, if I will also say there's an optional reading that I shared with you all that where I write about it in some more detail. So if you're not getting enough in this answer, I'll, um, it's, it's on the website. Excellent. Okay, so if you're not considered a citizen and you can't vote, were you still expected to no. pay taxes as a Native American? Um, yes, so yes. And so, um, so taxation is uh, something, of course, 
federal income tax reached very few people um, during the First World War, but it applies to anyone who earns money in the United States, um, regardless of, of their citizenship. Um, and other taxes, state level taxes or tariffs, other sort of obligations um, are generally applied regardless of, of citizenship, both a century ago and, and, and today. Okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how children would pressure adults to make sure they were registered for the draft in World War I? Uh, so, uh, let's see, how children pressured adults. Um, and so I think in some ways we're going to see a little bit of this when we read that letter from, from the young, uh, young man in, in Connecticut, um, the sort of enthusiasm that some children brought to, uh, to the war effort, um, and really wanting to kind of identify their, their contributions to the war effort. Um, and I think this is also a great opportunity for, you know, a research project. Um, I find that, um, often, you know, teaching, um, teaching the history of childhood in wartime is a great way for, for kids today of, of lots of ages, you know, early grades to, to advanced grades, to really kind of think about uh, sort of, uh, what it means to be a citizen at a time when some of the obligations of war, like military service, would exclude children, right? Um, so children, uh, you know, played a role in, in, in the war effort, um, for sure. Um, they certainly sometimes played a role in ensuring that members of their own family registered for uh, for the draft, um, uh, and, you know that their own parents would do so. Um, it's a it's a family kind of it's it's a family affair in a lot of ways. Excellent. So, what you talked about the Jones Act in reference to Puerto Rico and the Philippines did that affect other U.S. territories, and is was it in, in the same way or in different ways? Yeah. So I think it's important to um, to understand there's a there's a difference in the early 20th century between what are called incorporated territories and unincorporated territories. And this is a distinction that enters uh, U.S. history after 1898. So before that, um, all, of, all of the territories, say, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, um, and in fact, ultimately, Alaska and Hawaii are incorporated territories, things that are on a path to statehood um, once they've, you know, sort of adopted a constitution, have been approved by Congress, etc. Um, the Selective Service Act of 1917 applies in all of the incorporated territories um, and also applies to all U.S. citizens. The Jones Act had just extended U.S. citizenship um, to, to Puerto Rico, so it applies in Puerto Rico, um, but it had not been extended um, to, to the Philippines, um, where Filipinos were not uh, sort of uniformly made U.S. citizens. Um, and so the Selective Service Act did not actually apply in the Philippines. But for territories like Hawaii and Alaska, it, it does apply. And, and in fact, um, there's some great uh, posters um, from the National Archives that you can find online of uh, draft registration posters um, in Hawaii published in all of the languages that people were using in Hawaii, in Asian languages and in Native Hawaiian and, and, and other texts. Interesting. I, I think there's some local history day products that are gonna jump at some of our teachers. Yeah. All right, Anne, I'm going to tighten your question down a little bit. You've got students working on an NHD project talking about Native Americans who served in World War I and the citizenship question. And she's asking, are there some tribes or maybe individuals who lobbied or advocated for this citizenship? Um, and if not, why did Congress do it? Okay, yeah, this is a good question. That there are um, Native American leaders and in fact ordinary uh, soldiers who served were not of one mind about about the citizenship question um, during the first world war that some of them felt um, strenuously that this was uh, an opportunity to show uh, what that you know what native americans had done for the united states and that they should be rewarded with citizenship a story that will sound familiar to us as we think about African Americans, uh, about uh, sort of immigrant European immigrant Americans, and, and even other groups later in the 20th century, um, and that's definitely the case. And there are certain leaders um, uh, who were advocating for this. Um, I am blanking on the name of the main organization, but I know that it's in that um, in that optional reading um, that get active in the 1920s, trying to kind of really uh, sort of uh, expand citizenship. And, and Congress's motivation is really to make citizenship uniform. Um, and this is part of what I, my overall argument at the, the lecture tonight is: there was a, a real attempt to kind of pinpoint everyone, to sort of get everybody's identities sort of nailed down, right? Um, if they're part of the United States or mark them somehow as, as aliens or, or outsider. Um, the, there were, um, you know, certainly there were some who, who opposed it, um, and it's, it, um, 
it's uh, it was really a way of sort of saying that they wanted to maintain their own identity there as, as as citizens of, of native nations um, and, and sort of challenging it, it in that sense okay here's a question in regards specifically to African Americans how would the experience of citizenship for African Americans be different during World War One while serving in Europe as opposed to being home in the American South or even the American North mm-hmm uh, no, that is a good question. I focused uh, tonight really on the experience of, of African Americans on, on the home front, um, whether in the rural South or, or as larger numbers of them are moving uh, to, to the North or elsewhere. Um, and there, it's, uh, it's not so much a question of are they citizens of the United States in that formal sense. It's more a question of are they citizens in the sense of, be, of belonging, of, of being part of this story, right? Um, and that's, I think, where you can see um, a lot of this, uh, you know, politics of claiming citizenship uh, uh, through military service, and African Americans who are serving in Europe are doing that every day, right? They are uh, they are claiming citizenship, not to uh, have you know have a passport or to have a you know a, cl- a, a claim on U.S. citizenship in a formal sense, which they've already got, right? Um, but also then um, to in order to sort of document. Um, their inequalities, to, to use their military service to claim equal rights. And, and this famous line from W.E.B. Du Bois from 1919, where he says, we return from fighting, we return fighting. Right? Um, and I think that uh, the webinar Professor Lent Smith did last year really gives you a sense of how, how that, uh, that fight over equality and, and, and freedom, which is informed by their military service abroad, um, it gets played out through the language of citizenship here in the U.S. Like I said, I told my teachers, if you didn't have an idea for a lesson and connections here, you're going to have one tonight. All right, okay. let's do three more and then we'll jump. Uh, next question is about slackers. So if you get caught in one of these raids, how long could you be held and were you forced to register while you were detained? That's a good question. And um, there is a... Uh, uh, the answer is um, it depends. It depends on how hard it is for you to prove um, how old you are or, or something like that, right? So if you think about it, um, the vast majority of, of draft age men between 18 and 45 did register. They got those cards. They might not have actually been carrying them, right? So slacker raids were sort of surprise events. They happened, um, they happened on, um, you know, on city streets. They happened at movie theaters. They happened um, at the, on the Staten Island Ferry in New York. They happened at, uh, you know, sort of baseball stadiums in Chicago. If you weren't holding your draft card at that moment, um, then you might find yourself in detention. And really only until um, someone from your family shows up with the draft card or your draft board um, confirms that in fact actually your your on your your paperwork's okay. If you hadn't registered, um, then you were that's a different story. If you were eligible for the draft and you hadn't registered, then you would not only have to register for the draft, but would find yourself immediately liable for service. Right. Um, so some men go directly from the slacker rates into the into the U.S. Army. Their numbers are pretty small um, compared to the number who had merely forgotten to carry their cards or we're trying to convince authorities, well, I'm not 18 yet, or I'm over 45. And if you don't have those documents, that's gonna be hard to, hard to do. Um, so for me, this, the reason I think the slacker raids are important is not just because they're an interesting story of American history, it's an, it's an amusing, interesting moment, uh, but also because what they show about federal power, right? that we now probably, every single one of us walks around um, at all times with some sort of document that would document our identity, a government issued ID, probably a driver's license, right? Um, but in 1917, that was a new experience, right? And so I like to teach students about big questions like federal power by giving them a really concrete example, like a driver's license right, or a birth certificate, right? Um, and a lot is at stake in that. Right? And so I think that you know, we try to teach these, these, these big issues, and this is a way to get at, the, at, at, the little, at them through a little, a little moment. Okay. Um, one other follow-up question to the Jones Act. Why was citizenship extended to Puerto Ricans and not Filipinos or other places? What, what is it about Puerto Rico that that exception or distinction was made? 
Well, you know, this is, um, uh, let's see, do, if we have three and a half more hours, I'll give you my full, I'll, my full answer. Um, but I'm going to give a, a short answer, which is um, that it, there were domestic political issues um, that were at work in why Congress makes uh, two different Jones Acts, one for Puerto Rico and one for the Philippines. And remember, 1898 was not that long ago. These were relatively new uh, territorial acquisitions. They had been acquired after the Spanish-American War and the Philippine-American War, um, acquired by uh, a series of Republican administrations, McKinley, Roosevelt, Taft. Um, when Woodrow Wilson comes in, um, he's the first Democratic president, the first Democratic Congress to think about, the, about colonial policy. Um, and the Democrats had opposed much of, 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 of the war. Some of them had opposed um, empire and, and the acquisition of these colonies in the first place. So there are domestic reasons why uh, Congress wants, um, and the Democrats in particular, wanted uh, to move the Philippines toward independence um, and move Puerto Rico toward citizenship. Um, so, it, so the reasons are, are sort of different in the two different cases. I'll also say, and, and this is worth, um, you know, worth sort of uh, Googling about there are several um, uh, sort of great Puerto Rican historians who've written about this. Um, there is a, a, a sort of common folklore among many Puerto Ricans, um, both in Puerto Rico and in the mainland US, that this was a quid pro quo, right? That citizenship was imposed on Puerto Rico in order to force them um, uh, to serve in the military. Technically speaking, that's not true, right? That the draft um, could have been extended uh, to Puerto Rico even without the Jones Act. Um, but I think it's an important story that many people in uh, the Puerto Rican diaspora tell to make sense of federal power, right? Um, that even if it's not historically accurate, it's historically significant, right? Um, and so um, there are you know, sort of ways of, of, of thinking about uh, how federal power is imposed on Puerto Ricans, um, not only in 1917, but across much of the 20th century. And uh, this leads to this kind of folkloric story um, that, that, that circulates wisely, or widely. Excellent. Okay, I've got two more questions. I'm going to hold them for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, Should let's... we chat a little bit about letters and then we'll jump to some active learning strategies? I would love to. I would love to. And um, so I um, did not put the uh, letters up on, on the screen. So if you are, if you're working with them at home, they, you know, these were shared, you should have access to them. Um, and I want to just maybe tell you a little bit about why I picked them. And then I'm going to throw a couple questions out and, and we'll, you know, let Lynn um, sort of manage some of the answers. Uh, when I was working on my research on the First World War, you know, my question was, was this relationship um, between ordinary people and the federal government? You know, what happens at that moment where Uncle Sam points at you and says, I want you, right? What happens to the people on the other end of that, of that finger, right? Um, and I think that their history is 20th century American history, um, when you put it together. And I think one of the best places to look for it is moments where they are they are writing this down, where they are writing to the to either the federal government, their state government, um, to sort of document their their citizenship status, to kind of find a place for themselves in the war effort. So I was doing some research in the Connecticut State Archives, um, in part because it's um, it's near where I live, um, in here in New England, um, but also because they did a really good job of of keeping um, their materials. Um, uh, so for anyone who's who's in that area, there's some great sources. Um, and I came across these two different letters, um, and I wanted to choose one um, that you see from uh, from a, uh, a young boy, right, twelve years old, um, from you know Sir William Yeomans of Northville, Connecticut, um, who wants to be a volunteer um, and do his part, um, and one from a woman named Mrs. Raynell Ryder, um, who um, is really sort of you know trying to um, to also do her part for the war, um, but she's trying to get a job, right? Um, and finding um, that uh, racial discrimination is keeping her from access to, to a job, right? So I wanted to start um, by just asking, um, you know, what does, uh, when we think about the word volunteer, um, we think about this as um, people doing something, doing their part for, for in this case, a war effort, um, by their own volition, right? They're choosing to do so. Um, that they're doing it maybe without being paid, right? uh, and that they're doing it as, as ordinary people, not as government employees. 
right? So these are different ways of thinking about volunteerism, right? Um, and so one of the questions is, um, you know, are, are these two people volunteers, right? Um, what, do, what, are they, what do they want this war to be? Um, and what part do they want in it, right? So, you know, this is maybe not the first question I would start with with fifth graders or eighth graders, <laughs> um, but you all are, you know, you, know, you all are, are better historians um, and you all know how to read cursive, um, so you can read these letters. And um, so, you know, what, what, are the, what do they want? Um, uh, and so let's just start with that question and, and then I'll, I want to follow up a little bit. Go ahead, type your question or type your responses in the question box. I know it's a little backwards uh, and we'll verbalize as many as I can. Um, don't worry if you have a question in there, I still have them jotted down and we'll get to them. So what are your thoughts on volunteerism? Now when I hear volunteerism, I also think of the joke of being, you know, sometimes you're volunteers and sometimes you're voluntold. Yes. Um, I think, um, yeah, in some ways, the Uncle Sam Wants You poster is the history of being voluntold, for sure. Right. We're either being shy or we're typing an awful lot. Right. Keep your answer short, guys. Right. You know, think about what's the thought or the idea that pops in your head. Okay, we've got a couple here. Um, the idea of doing things on your own time. Mm -hmm. Um, also, you know, if you want to be recognized as a per participating citizen, mm -hmm. then that could potentially lead to equal or more equal rights if you participate. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. A couple other things. Other thoughts. Um, wanting to help others. Um, shows how well Wilson and the Creole Committee sold the war. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. You know, uh, throughout American history, we've always had volunteers. Yeah, uh, it's always been part of kind of the American tradition, even in the military. Yes, and I let me just talk about that for one second while some more, well, lots more answers come in. Um, that I think that this moment of World War One is a time where the U.S. government is depending on volunteers, right? Um, so it's not just that they're, de they're depending on it because it's part of the national tradition, it's good politics, it makes us feel good about doing our part for the war. Um, it's also that we needed volunteers in order to get this war effort off the ground. Remember, I say that the federal government is growing, right? but it was still really small in April 1917. Um, it didn't have uh, you know, a huge FBI. It didn't have uh, a huge army. It didn't have you know, all these powers. Um, so volunteers really step into that space. They also change America by doing their volunteering. Right? Now, to some extent, someone mentioned the, the Creel Committee. Right? This is the Committee on Public Information. Uh, a federal agency that is designed to share information. You might call it propaganda. They called it information um, to sort of say that it was, uh, you know, that it was completely neutral and, um, but it was encouraging and in some ways even pressuring people um, to do their part, um, to buy bonds, to save food, uh, to sort of, con you know, do their part for the government. And they did. Um, people, that people's volunteerism was a crucial part of the success of the war. Um, but as they're doing it, they are being sort of told by the federal government. They have a new relationship to the federal government, right? Um, but they're also changing um, what it means to be an American um, through all of these sort of very ordinary kinds of volunteering. Right? Well, one interesting it, idea that kind of dropped in is the idea that not everyone can enlist. The military is open to a limited space, but everybody or almost everybody can volunteer in some way. Yes. Um, and I think that that's in part why I shared these, these letters, one by a, a boy who's too young for the military. Um, and you can see he clearly wants to be part of it. He's even got that drawing of him, you know, killing Germans um, uh, in, in his letter. Um, but also another from, from an African-American woman who also would have been sort of excluded from, from military service, wants to do her part. Um, and I think when you read the letter, so here's a question. Um, uh, does it seem like she wants to be part of the war effort? Does she just want a job? Right? Remember, she has financial needs. She has sick family members that she needs to take care of. Right? Um, and we know that this, this is a good job um, in this factory that, that she wants. Does she want just a job? Or does she also want, in some ways, um, 
equality for African Americans, right? Um, and how do we how do we read, you know, one letter from one person and to think about the experience of of groups more 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 broadly? Uh, one interesting idea that got dropped in is it'd be interesting. Of course, I probably couldn't know this, but how what propaganda posters, letters, news that the people had seen mm -hmm. that may have inspired the letters. Oh, it could have I been think, something yeah. It could have been nothing at all. Um, I, I wish that we could do a little sort of, <laughs> ex, you know, psychological experiment and say which posters cause people to do which things. That we won't know. We do know that they saw enormous numbers of them. Um, uh, and they saw, for example, 24 million posters of Uncle Sam Wants You. Uh, in that case, that's a military recruitment poster looking for military volunteers, um, particularly in the period right, actually right before the draft comes in. Um, but that's, you know, so we know that was one of the most popular posters, um, but they saw, they saw tens of thousands of different ones, um, and they would have seen um, parades, they would have seen dis public displays, they would have um, uh, seen film clips, um, uh, they would have heard music and speeches. Um, so we know they're, they're surrounded by, by people telling them, uh, sort of telling them what to do. We've also got a comment here that, you know, it, that people do benefit from volunteering, whether you're looking for a job or looking for acceptance. Um, yes, no, that is absolutely true. Um, and that, um, you know, I think it's a, um, the reason I asked that question, you know, do we think uh, Mrs. Ryder is, uh, looking, you know, is she trying to change America or just looking for a job? And um, is that, that was a deliberately bad question. Right? Uh, and sometimes I ask my students deliberately bad questions so that they can, you know, sort of pull a question apart and realize, um, you know, especially high school level, you know, where they're sort of more advanced levels, um, you know, to get these kind of critical thinking skills really going. And the reason I say it's a bad question is that of course she's doing both. Right? And, and she may not know uh, that she's trying to change America um, as she's doing it, but she's participating with thousands of other African Americans in trying to change workplace scenarios. Right? Um, I have a question. Uh, from yeah. your research, did you ever find out if she got the job? Uh, I, I wish I knew. Um, I don't know. Um, and there's no record of an, there's actually no record of an answer to her letter. She wrote to the governor um, of, uh, of Connecticut. Um, she was living in Connecticut. Uh, but it was filed with um, other materials that suggested there was an investigation of these defense contracts. So I know enough to know that, that they at least looked into it. I don't know whether, you know, I don't know whether the policies were changed and I certainly don't know whether she got this job. Um, and I even tried, um, you know, looking her up in, in Ancestry.com and trying to, you know, sort of find, find if she has, you know, descendants or anything, but, but it's, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to track any of that down. I'll also throw out, there was a question earlier about getting access to a World War I draft card. The mm -hmm. easiest way to do that is through Ancestry. I know there's a paywall there, so any teachers in the class, if you'd like an example of one, shoot me an email tomorrow and I'll send you a, I'll send you a sample. That's, that's easy. We got a bunch of them saved for some other research projects we've done. So that'll help you in your classroom say the word and we'll uh, either Ashley and I will push it out tomorrow to anybody who asks for one or thinks it'll be helpful. Uh, we use and our actually, ancestry account a lot here. Let me actually add to that because uh, the, the National Archives regional branches, which is where most of these would be, uh, be on, uh, in storage, um, have actually, they have digitized a lot of them, right? And certainly if you just want to sample you, uh, the National Archives branch in Atlanta has put up a bunch of the draft cards of, um, of famous people. Um, so Babe Ruth and um, Harry Houdini and Chef Boyardee, who I didn't realize was a real person. Um, you know, their draft cards are, are, are all available. So if you, you know, if you, and, and there's also blanks um, if you wanted to see a blank form. Um, and so, you know, many of them have been, uh, uh, they, I will say the interface with Ancestry, which you do have to pay for, is easier if you're actually doing your own family history. But if you just want to, you know, find one, it's, uh, there are plenty of them out there. I've also got a note from one of our teachers that the Mississippi Department of Archives, who hosts NHD Mississippi, has been digitizing World War I draft cards for their state, too. 
Yes, and you can definitely, you can find local and state agencies, things that are doing this. And it's pretty hard, as many people may know, to find uh, military service records from World War I, um, in part because there was an enormous fire at the National Archive, or National Personal Records Center in St. Louis um, in the 1970s that, that destroyed many of them. But many states also kept their own uh, records of the military service of people in their state. And so if you wanted to do kind of local or state projects, uh, there are great ways to do that. I'll put in a little plug uh, for, uh, for Missouri today. Um, the uh, uh, Missouri Over There is a great website, web project um, that has done uh, a lot of local history. You don't have to be from Missouri to, uh, uh, to use that site, but if you're doing kind of state and local history, it's a great one and a partnership with the National World War I Museum um, in Kansas City. Excellent. Um, so okay. can, Lynn, can we switch to the, um, to the other document? Because I think it's really um, one that I really like to, to talk through with people. Go for it. Let's knock on that, and then I'll jump to some strategies and wrap us at that. Okay, perfect. So, um, so let me also just tell you about this this document. What um, this is? It's the header um, that says "From the Minutes of a German American Women's Sewing Club, May Fourteenth, Nineteen Eighteen." And I'm not going to uh, read it out loud. Um, you have access to it, but I want to um, uh, assure you that I do know how to spell. Um, and uh, and what, I, what you're looking at in this document is how this document was spelled in the sources in the archives itself. Um, and so I was doing some research and there's a chapter of the book that, um, that I didn't share, but I, I can certainly um, share it with people if they're particularly interested, uh, about women's volunteerism right, and, how, and women's organization. And so I did a lot of research, basically trying to find the records of any women's organization I could get my hands on and just see what did they do in 1918. Right? And so I found this organization called the Ladies Sewing Society of the German Orphan Asylum of Washington, D.C. Um, at the Schlesinger Library, which is a really great collection of women's history uh, materials. And I was just reading through it and it was in German and it was in this, with, in this really handwriting that's really hard to read and I wasn't getting a whole lot out of it. And then suddenly on May 14th, I turned the page and, and I see this paragraph, right? Um, typed up actually, not handwritten typed up and sort of pasted into the, the, the collections. Um, and I wanted to just share it with you um, and ask you for, for your response. Um, you know, um, what do you see um, here in terms of the history of federal power, uh, the legacies of the war, and this question of, of volunteerism? Um, what kind of choice um, are the German American women making um, at this moment in May of 1918? So you know we can give people a little time to type and, and, and let's see what um, what responses come up. Absolutely. Let's see here. Uh, we do have a question as to why Dr. Capizal only provided three primary sources. Um, that's my fault because I put a limit on him for reading length. So you all didn't jump down my throat and kill me. Um, so obviously there are a dozen other hundreds, probably hundreds of other primary sources to use. So the limit was really because of me. So go ahead, let's post this. Oh, here we go. Um, so question or response okay actually it's really a question coming from katie here she wants to know did they want to prove that they were loyal americans or loyal to america okay yeah no that is a good question i think um that um you know they they are explaining why they've made this change right um to the language right that we will conduct our our meetings in the future in in the language of this land of our choice Right? And I think that that phrase um, is really telling, right? It's sort of showing that they are Americans, right? That they were, you know, they were working with, um, basically the German Orphan Asylum works with immigrant kids, right? Sort of who were, you know, might've been orphans. They might've been, you know, basically foster children, right? Um, uh, before there was really a foster system. They were supporting those kids, but they, um, they were showing that they were citizens of this country. And by that, they mean the United States. So I think that they're showing loyalty. Um, but I think some of you who are just writing in the last few seconds are also adding 
um, this question, well, who, who do they feel like they have to show this to? Right? And so think back to the power of the Alien Enemy Act um, and, the enemy, and the Alien Registration Act um, that comes after that requires German citizens. Many of these um, people might have been among them, right? That they have to um, sort of register with the federal government. They know that the, if they criticize the government, they could be they could be, face um, consequences, right? Um, and they also know that people don't trust uh, Germans who speak still speak German, right? Um, so they want to show that they're Americans, right? And so, so that's you know I think some people are saying that, but let me ask a follow up question, right? Um, who are they really writing this for? Who's going? Who's actually going to read this? That it's a, it's a document that is in their minutes, in a notebook, right? That they might um, sort of, you know, just keep in their organization, okay? Um, and I think in some ways they're communicating to, as, as one person says, right? They're writing this for themselves, right? They're writing it for maybe their, their children, their next uh, generation, right? Um, suggesting to them, um, you know, sort of what this moment was. Right? I think they're sort of communicating um, to, to the future, right? Um, that this was a choice they made. And they say, we conform to this necessity as good citizens of this country, right? They are trying to do that. Um, but they're also adding, we only feel very sad that such a change had to take place, right? So they are kind of writing, writing their history into, into these minutes, right? Um, and I think that they, you know they are they're they're sort of telling that story, and I think we can see both the the power and pressure that they're experiencing, um, but also <clears throat> the difficult choices that they're making. Um, and I think German Americans are a, a clear case of this in World War One. I. I think many other groups in different histories also face these challenges uh, a century you know a century later. Excellent. Okay, I know I'm getting tight on time, so I want to do a little quick jump here. We'll okay. come back at the end. We put the survey link up because we get a couple more questions, and if you've got them, go ahead and put them in. But one thing that I want to mention really quickly that I think is key, I think, you know, I think we've got your history brains going, but I also think it's important to get your teacher brains going. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important. I think primary source analysis absolutely matters. But I also think that we have to then do something with it. And if you've ever worked with me on one of my programs, when you're writing lesson plans, the thing I always ask my teachers is, what are the students doing? They've got to do something. Give me active verbs. And I think when we think about active learning strategies, the big four kind of come to mind, right? Students have to read, they have to write, they have to think, they have to talk. I agree with those. I think you should be doing those every gosh darn day in your room. But I want to throw out five other strategies that you might not automatically think of that might give you some ideas as you're building your final assessments. First strategy I always love to do is mess with perspective. Give students alternate points of view and force them into them. In the end, I always tell my students, they don't have to agree with them, but they have to understand why these points of view exist. So just two kind of quick World War I ideas. Have the students campaign against US entry into World War I. A lot of times they assume that, well, we had to go and we wanted to go and everybody wanted to go. But when you actually study, it's really not the case. But I think it's important to understand that point of view. Um, I would also ask students to think about being the first US diplomat to return to Germany after World War I. What would his priorities be? Who would he be reaching out to? What problems would he have to solve? The second strategy of active learning is questioning. You've got to drive your students to ask all kinds of questions. And kind of some fun ways that I would use in a classroom. Uh, the first one seems stupid and it absolutely works. When you hit a concept or an idea that's complicated, stop your teaching and say, okay, I'm gonna stop here. I am not moving forward until we have two really good questions. And then you have to wait it out. And it might take two minutes of silence or five minutes of silence. But what I have found is that every time I've done that with students, everybody stares at each other for about 30 seconds. And then, man, some really good questions get started. Make sure to give wait time for your students. Don't be afraid of a little bit of silence or a little bit of giggling. Uh, another strategy that I love to do, I modeled this with some teachers in West Virginia a few weeks ago. We 
looked at a primary source and then projected the whole source and said, okay, I said, I'm going to take questions, but I am not going to answer anything. Give me any questions that you have or your students might have. And we lit it. We used a smart board. So we wrote up all those questions. And then once we finished with the questions, I said, okay, who can answer some of them? So I would redirect to the students to answer as many as they can. And then I, as a teacher, would only answer what the class cannot. Obviously, sometimes you have to jump in. And with younger students, you'll have to jump in a little more than with older. But let them see themselves as the source of knowledge. Um, third thing, scaffold questions. I think scaffolding questions is important, and I think it's important to sometimes start with some easy ones. I used to call these the fast pitch down the middle questions. Don't be afraid to call on students sometimes, and sometimes call on students who you know have answers, because sometimes that helps, especially if a student who's weak or struggling. If you have a quest conversation with that student before class, and you know they know the answer, even if it's a review of what we did yesterday, start with that student, because I think when students can either answer a question correctly or ask a question that's on point, that will encourage them to ask more. I also think another dumb trick, reward the coolest question of the day or the coolest question of the week. It's not that hard to have a pile of, you know, hot pink index cards. And when a student asks a really good question, go, that's awesome. Write it down, stick it up on a wall and just encourage that culture. All right. Debate, discuss. I think we have to do this in history class, but I think we have to not be afraid of, turn, you know, I think sometimes when we say debate, students think we're going to CNN or Fox News, and that's not the kind of debate that we want, because we really want students to think critically. So one fun idea that I think would be neat is to imagine that the leaders of the Congress of Vienna were commenting on the Treaty of Versailles give students or small groups of students roles to play the role of Austria or Great Britain or Prussia or France. Um, I have a little bias for this because I have a really cool simulation on the Congress of Vienna. And then maybe I'd switch up their roles and bring in the contemporaries or maybe those in the future to kind of discuss the past, the present, and the future. Because we're really trying to get students to think critically about causes and effects. And I think a great way to do it is to get them to take a perspective of somebody who might have been in the past or might be coming in the future. Don't forget to let students process. I think it's important to make learning visible in lots of different ways. One thing I would do is, again, simple, no tech involved. I would really just start with my students of saying, okay, you know, what are the legacies? And literally start to draw them out. Build yourself a concept map. You can do this high tech, you can do this low tech. It works on a piece of paper just as well as it works on a smart board. Another favorite activity I have to get students thinking is an activity that I called Chalk Talk. It works on a chalkboard, works on a whiteboard, works on an online discussion board, it works on butcher paper. Sometimes we all have to be quiet in order to think. So if I would have review period, the first X number of minutes, I'd do less for middle schoolers, longer for high schoolers, no one was allowed to talk. You had to stop, you had to review, you had to read. When you had a question, I want you to have a question. You get up without saying a word to anybody and you write your question on the board. Other students can get up and comment or respond. And sometimes as the teacher, you might say, hold, we're gonna talk about that in 20 minutes. Get lots of different ideas generated and I would encourage students at the end, I'm like, hey, you want to take a picture of this to take it home and study? Go for it. But making that thinking visible will help not just the student who has the question, but other students who maybe didn't even think about that as a question. All right, number, uh, finally, connections. We've got to build connections between past knowledge and future knowledge. So one thing that I would do is throw up a bunch of historical events. And depending on the age and level of your students, sometimes I might put all of them up. I might start with five, I might put 25 on a board. And I'd say, okay, draw me the connection. And that doesn't mean just draw a line from box one to box two, but then you have to draw and write on top of that line, what is the connection? I also encourage students to use arrows. In what way does one event lead to another? Does it then spiral or return back and have an effect? Start with a couple, let them add more boxes. You'd be surprised. The more visual we can make their thinking, the better chance of it sticking in their brains. Okay, we've done an awful lot tonight. I've got a couple more questions I wanna ask, 
but you know the drill in order to get credit for the webinar you've got to do the survey so jot it down tinyurl.com slash wwicc feedback you've used the same link the whole time that's on purpose because it all populates in the same spreadsheet all right while we're doing that dr capizola i have a couple more questions for you all right all right, first question, uh, as I told Ryan that, you know, I kind of limited your primary sources so you couldn't give me 100, but he wants to know why did you choose these three examples to give us? All right, um, and I think that these three um, go really well with some of the documents that, or some of the, the ideas that were in the talk that I did tonight and then also in the, the chapter of the book that I, I shared with you. Um, places where I really felt like um, ordinary Americans were sort of figuring out their place in the federal, in this new federal government, right? Um, and I think that they sort of show a century ago how people were understanding, you know, sort of their, their place as, as Americans. Um, and, you know, there are, I picked, I picked some, you know, very anonymous kind of people on, on purpose, right? You can do this. I also deliberately didn't pick propaganda posters because I think that a lot of times when people are teaching about World War One at um, the sort of, you know, say junior high school, high school level that, uh, you know, that we often go first toward those propaganda images and assign them all the power, right? And I wanted to focus on, the, on what's on the other end of that Uncle Sam pointing at you, right? How are people responding when they get pointed at? Um, I would uh, I would love to add in some more letters, um, some more documents, um, uh, and I think that if you were going to sort of look for more of these, um, you can you know there's plenty of them out there already assembled. But it's also like what we ask um, ask the what are the questions we ask of these, right? So thinking about some of the exercises that you that Lynn just walked through with you, you know I was thinking also what are the skills that a document like this could could teach are the historical thinking skills of perspective, um, of, of interest, of point of view. Um, you know, that's, that's some of the easier thing to get at. But then also, how do people use language, right? These are, um, especially in the Mrs. Raynal Ryder's one and the, in the minutes, uh, these are people choosing, um, you know, making choices about language. So if you're also kind of trying to teach um, sort of communication or teach um, you know, so writing skills, there can be ways to get it from that. Um, another question I often ask students um, in a situation like this is, well, where does, where does this document leave you? What do you need next? Right, um, and that can be a good way for thinking, you know, because there's no one document is gonna have all the answers, right? So, um, you know, so if you were in my class, I would say, okay, well, these are the three, these are three I gave you. What are the next three you wanna read? Right? What's not answered in these questions, right? Um, and so I think that you know that that's a you know good way of dealing with you know as students because then it, often they'll ask you in their paper, you know how many sources do I need for my paper? Like when they do that first re you know research paper, um, and the answer is it depends, right? And when they get to college, the answer is going to be it depends. Um, and so I think that um, you know this can be a good way of, of thinking about that. Absolutely. I think it's also an interesting to, to show students the difference between primary and secondary sources. Yeah. Read one letter. Obviously, they can't read all of Dr. Capizola's book. They can read a paragraph or two. Put the supports and the structures in they need to help them and help them see the connection. How do we go from a primary source to drawing a conclusion? That's one of our big skills with History Day. All right. I think I am down to time for just one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, so make sure if you're listening, you jot down that survey link. Um, is there any research comparing enlistment figures in 1917 with enlistment figures in 1941, 1942? A couple mm -hmm. of our teachers had questions kind of along those lines. Um, no, well, and I think it's worth thinking about. Um, uh, I'll start by sort of talking about not the specific question, but the general one, which is um, that it's hard a lot of times to teach about World War I <laughs> and there's like a bigger war coming a couple of weeks later. Um, and, uh, and, you know, for most Americans, World War I sort of falls through the cracks of the Civil War and the Second World War. Um, but I think what I tried to do tonight and then some of the, the things that, 
that I shared and that I think a lot of the other people in the webinars have done all this fall is help us see this as a crucial turning point, right? Um, for sort of all the big themes of modern American history, right? So, I, you know, I think even almost all the big questions of the second half of, uh, uh, of, the, of the school year um, come up in this particular sort of moment of history, a really short period of time. Okay, so that's the general answer. The specific question about sort of military um, recruitment and volunteerism, you know, the draft applies in both wars. Um, it is complicated because, um, you know, the, the, the U.S. participation in the First World War is shorter. Um, so, and it also continues to allow volunteers, particularly through the National Guard. Right, so people who are joining um, state militias and the National Guard uh, may be sort of continuing to serve in, in the Army as volunteers. Uh, the Navy and uh, Marines um, uh, were uh, volunteer forces only um, throughout the First World War. Um, in the Second World War, uh, the draft actually comes in before uh, Pearl Harbor in 1940. Um, and the draft is, uh, is, applies to serve all of the services, although there are ways for people to volunteer um, during the Second World War as well. Uh, about um, four million men eventually serve in, in uniform during the First World War, um, and, and 25,000 women um, almost exclusively in the Navy um, uh, and the Army Nurse Corps. Um, and uh, the, the numbers are so much greater during the Second World War, about 24 million uh, people serve um, in, in uniform during the Second World War. It's a larger war, um, and it's a longer war. Um, certainly, the U.S. Uh, anticipated World War I would go on uh, until at least 1920. They probably anticipated um, that they might ultimately draft, you know, 10 million people. Um, they never, they never did that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I just want to take a moment and say thank you to Dr. Capizola and a huge thank you to the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission for sponsoring this program. We have uh, really had great responses both in 2018 and in the fall of 2019. And we're excited for the way it's brought a whole new way of teaching and learning about this topic into our classrooms. Teachers, just some quick reminders, final assessments due on Monday night. That really does mean Monday night because our grades are due on Wednesday and you don't want us grading yours last because it's a rush job. Also keep in mind, it's an activity. It's not a unit plan. Please don't turn in six different lessons and say, hey, what do you think? Also, if you have a question, email me, email Ashley, email Marion. Please don't wait till 10 minutes before it's due. We are more than happy to help you. You just got to give us a little time to do that. Uh, remember, the law of numbers that hits you in your classroom also hits us here. All right, I'm going to wrap things up and say thank you, Dr. Capazzola, for joining us. We're going to kill our recording. And if we missed anything or missed a question, shoot me an email tomorrow and we'll go from there. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful night. Thank you.